um, I'm going to interview Sean for this keynote. And uh, I think um, we should give Sean a, a round of applause because he's actually on crutches. So it was very hard for him to get here. Do you want to tell people how you, how did, how did that happen? So wait, now, it, it, now I get a round of applause for just twisting my ankle playing exactly. basketball? Exactly. Well, we gotta, let's applaud achievement. You know, I should, but anyway, yeah, thanks. Basketball injury, weekend warrior. But wasn't, you made it wasn't here. Pretty. So, so uh, actually, I would have, actually, it was the two and a half hour ride from Santa Monica that really deserves the, the real applause. So Quinn Daly, who helped me get over here, thank you, Quinn, for driving two and a half hours from Santa Quinn, Monica. Quinn, she's a rock star. To be here. So Sean, Sean is a, a first time entrepreneur, I believe. This is a, you know, he was in private equity and then he started a company and boom, he went public and it's a billion dollar company. You ever say like, man, I'm, I'm really good at this? Um, first time and my company went public. Well, you know, when I was in the private equity business, I think, uh, you know, and I know a lot of good venture guys and private equity guys, you really need to think of yourself as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, so I, had the, I really had the benefit and the luxury of learning from some of the best entrepreneurs and I had 10 years to be able to pick up a lot of things that I think make people successful so I was able to channel that into an idea that I I knew was was big enough and then partnered with the right partner with Richard and and guys like John Hawkins and the right investors so we put a lot of the elements in place to try to ensure success right. back in 2005 when this was sort of uh, this idea was in your head uh, before YouTube really took off in 2006, before Facebook went mainstream, what was your thesis about media back then? Uh, I think there were, there were a couple of main themes that I was really trying to capitalize on, one of which was the emergence of new monetization platforms. I mean, I remember when Google went public and everybody was looking at their revenue growth and looking at their margins, the thing that I focused on was the payout ratio. So how big was the actual AdSense market? And I think at the time it was, you know, it was a, a little bit over a billion dollars, but it was, I mean, it wasn't even a billion yet, but it, it, I could see that market growing very quickly. And so I saw, okay, well, here's a monetization platform. There's been so much investment into the ad networks and the lead generation businesses. So th those were really uh, catalysts for this fragmented publishing universe that was evolving. So it was a combination of, and maybe, maybe the core driver was the monetization investments that led to the fragmentation, but it was really a function of those two things. And, that, and it just it became clear to me that that's what the web was going to be in the future, that you weren't going to go to a portal to try to get your information. You were just going to type something into Google or it was going to be referred to you through a friend. Right. And it didn't matter if it was... Uh, you know, trails.com or some other mountain bike site that you might be interested in, th that's where people were going to consume content. Did you have any idea of the potential of it all? I, I did. I mean, I really, I thought it was a, a you know, multi-billion dollar opportunity that was not bounded by geography. I had spent some time in London uh, with Spectrum. I opened up the office for Spectrum in, in London. And so I had a little bit of an understanding of how the European markets worked and how the internet market worked there. So I, I couldn't see any real barriers to it. And then what, what I was able to do was just continue to test that thesis by asking smart people what they, what they thought about it. Sure. And I, that, but I think that's one of the um, mistakes sometimes that entrepreneurs make is they, they hold on to their idea and they don't want to tell anybody about it because they're afraid that somebody might steal it. Um, right. But I, you know, I, and I remember feeling that way, but at one point I just sort of crossed over and said, screw it. I mean, I gotta, I gotta ask people what they think about it. Yeah, maybe there's a risk that somebody takes it and runs with it, but if you give birth to that idea, you're passionate about it, no one's gonna execute it as well as, as, well as you would. So. It's all about the execution. Yeah. What were some of the assumptions, and, and a lot of entrepreneurs do this, is uh, they come up with assumptions and then they turn out to be wrong. So what were some of the assumptions you had about the media industry that in hindsight were way off? Um, I think probably the biggest one was that the, br the way branded ad sales was done in 2005, I thought wouldn't exist in five years. So that's why when we started the company, we didn't have any br uh, focus on branded ad sales. We didn't have a budget for, for branded ad sales people. 
I just looked at the network investments and thought, man, in five years, the thing is going to be so efficient and so well targeted that you won't really need branded ad salespeople. Um, and you know that that has clearly turned out not to be not to be true. I think that the trends are still moving that way, but I was probably a bit naive in terms of just my understanding of the the agency marketplace and how, how, just how it all works. But that's something that most companies, when they're small, they're not going to have a branded ad sales team, but they can bring that in once they're larger and the scale that you're at. Um, so it doesn't sound like that was too hard of a, of a challenge for you, but tell us about a time when you were at some sort of crossroads and you had to make a decision and it went right or it went wrong. You can give me both. Well, I mean, I think in, any, in the life cycle of any company, you're going to have, uh, you know, you'll face these challenges and decision points. And I, I remember in the, kind of in the teeth of the recession um, that we were... You know, we, when we originally started the company, we had a little bit more of a user-generated model for content. And we had, eHow had a, a subdomain called WeHow, which was our anybody can publish model. And we saw some success there. We saw some traction in terms of the growth of the, of the audience, but we didn't really like the quality of the content. And we knew, we knew it was going to take a platform to be able to scale the production the way we wanted to and do it at the price points that we're going to make money. And so our, we, we had a board meeting where we basically asked the board for a, a big commitment to spend money to build this platform when everybody else was reading the, the Sequoia memo and saying, hey, let's, let's you know, pull back. And, and that's when you launched Demand Studio. That's when right? we launched the studio, yeah. And that's obviously turned out to be a big driver of value for us. So that was a, a good crossroads and, a, and a, a decision that went well. What about something that went wrong? We talked about... Um, you're, you're very acquisitive, that's what you do, you're head of M&A, yeah. and you talked about some acquisitions that turned out to be tuition deals. I, I, yeah. I love that, the way you coined that, so maybe explain that. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about paying tuition, it's, you know, if you make a mistake and you learn from it, that's a good thing, right? So it's like going to school, it's going to cost you money, but in the end, you should be better off for it. So, you know, there, were, uh, there have been uh, uh, a number of acquisitions that we made. I think, you know, one in particular where early on in the life cycle of the company, I thought we could be both a B2C publishing business and a, and a, a B2B publishing business. Because again, when you think about the bar you know, the monetization vehicles and the barriers to entry and global reach, the B2B publishing industry is a pretty big industry. And we did a couple of things in the aviation marketplace that, you know, in hindsight just turned out to be okay investments. I mean, some of them are actually still making money, but it's their, their non-core. But you pivoted quickly. We did. I think, you know, there's another pivot point, which was probably the games business, too. There were a few investments we made in casual gaming. And again, we've got such a great team. Guys like Joe Perez, who he's part of the founding team. He's been, he was at uh, Pogo. He com comes out of the casual gaming industry. And we had a good, solid vision for some Get, just to, to build something really significant in, in the casual games business. And so we made one or two investments to bulk up um, and bought some distribution and then just realized that that market was moving so fast that we just weren't going to be able to compete. So, Well, let's uh, talk, I mean, this is, you know, most of the, the keynotes are about your lessons learned. So there are a lot of people here, I'm sure, who are... Um, thinking about entrepreneurship or maybe first-time entrepreneurs, you started in private equity. Before you made that decision to become an entrepreneur, did you have any doubts making that transition? Um, yeah, I mean, I did. I, I certainly did. I mean, I had, uh, I had been at a great firm, Spectrum Equity Investors, a great firm for, for about 10 years. And, um, you know, the firm was continuing to grow and, and I was evolving there. But... I mean, I really tried to, tried to structure it so that I took as much risk out of the decision as possible. So it was, you know, we raised $120 million to start the company. So I, I kind of knew that we weren't going to be out of money in six months. Okay. Um, so I gave myself enough runway uh, to try to make this thing a success. And then, you know, financially, just tried to structure it so that when I played around with some of the different scenarios, upside scenario, base case, downside, 
was my, how did I fare in the downside case? And so I kind of felt pretty good about my, the downside scenario and sort of compared that to where I was and where I thought I'd be. What, what would your advice be to some entrepreneurs out here who are maybe contemplating, you know, taking the plunge and becoming an entrepreneur and leaving a cushy job like you had? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's not easy. I think you've got to have a good partner working with you. I mean, I think if you're on your own, I think it'd be, I think it'd be a little tougher. But um, if you have a good partner with a complementary skill set, I think that's probably the best piece of advice I give you. And, you know, and it sounds kind of logical, but just do that downside scenario planning and think about, okay, if this thing totally fails and I've put in two or three years, how, how do I feel about that relative to the trajectory I would have taken? And by the way, it's not just measured by money, right? It's measured by success and family life and personal satisfaction and a lot, there's a lot of other variables that go into it. Okay. So. Well, you took the plunge. Now you've been an entrepreneur for um, six, seven years now. Yeah. Is it six years? That's, yeah, the company's, well, years. the company's five years old. So. Okay, five years. Who, who, who's, your, who's been your mentor in, in, throughout that time and what did he or she teach you? Um, I, I, I think I've been pretty fortunate to have a lot of mentors and I think the guys at Spectrum I worked with for a long time, I really respect Vic Parker and Bill Kaleidos. Those guys have um, great track records as investors and, and they're just good people. You know, they're just, they're, they're, um, they, I think they lead by example. They work extremely hard and uh, they've been great. I mean, John Hawkins has been a great, a great mentor and, and friend. And, and I think Richard Rosenblatt too. And uh, you know, Richard is a guy who, uh, has had a lot of success, and I think part of that success is to just, he's so ag aggressive, you know, he's just so quick to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And he does not, he's not a guy who's gonna overanalyze a situation. I makes a quick read and then makes a decision. Are you then, the analytical one? I tend to, yeah, I mean, I think I definitely, having spent as much time as I did in the private equity business, I, that's a, th those guys tend to be, a little bit more cautious. The voice of reason. Well, you, you kind of get, if you make a mistake in the private equity or venture capital business, it, it, private equity especially, it's, a, it's different than venture, but if you make a big mistake in the private equity business, you're gonna get, you'll get killed because you can't afford to take a zero, so you can't really take that much risk, mm -hmm. and you're gonna put a lot of time into that investment. And that's really all you have as an investor is, is time. So I remember one of the things I used to, think through at Spectrum was you, you, you'd almost rather miss a great deal than do a bad one. That's the secret to longevity, I think, in that business. Isn't there as much risk in, uh, I mean, you guys raised $300 million. That's pretty risky. Um, well, I think we took a lot of risk out of the project by raising as much money as we did. So really? we certainly had return risk in terms of hitting a, you know, generating a sufficient exit for the investors, but we had enough capacity to do a lot of, a lot of different things. Okay. Well, let's say a lot, a lot has changed uh, since 2005 and the environment is very different. There's, uh, there's a lot more access to capital and uh, technology is, um, there's a lot more low cost technologies out there. How is it different starting a company today versus when you started it? Um, there's also different platforms, of course, like Facebook. Yeah. So how is it different today versus starting it back then? Well, I, I think you, I mean, one of the things you mentioned about the platforms is it, it's, I think it's potentially both a blessing and a curse. I mean, you've got Facebook and Twitter and there are, you know, companies like TweetDeck and, I mean, I can, you know, you can, the list is long, uh, obviously in terms of Twitter clients and Facebook businesses, you know, those, th those platforms are, they're new, people are looking for innovation so you can get, you can claim some territory in those markets relatively quickly, but those markets still aren't yet developed. So Facebook can just change its mind and all of a sudden your business is, you know, screwed. I mean, when we started, the only platform to really build on was Google. And Google in 2005 was, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. There was enough consistency in it to really understand how they might think and react. And you kind of knew, um, about the rev share mechanisms and trends. I mean, it was a little bit, it was, it was I hate to say predictable, because obviously it's really not, but um, we felt like it was at least predictable at the time. Well, well I want to touch on that, 
relying on Google, building your business model on that, but we're talking about the differences in starting your business. So we're in LA, LA now. Um, we're from, I'm from San Francisco area. Is, are there any differences in starting your business down in LA versus up in Silicon Valley? I mean, I've seen a number of successful, great companies and great entrepreneurs in LA. I've, you know, I lived in the Valley for a number of years. Um, I, 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 I think one consistent theme is that LA companies, at least it feels like to me, tend to make money earlier. They tend to be profitable. Um, so, wow, that's which I think is a good thing. When did you guys turn profitable? Uh, well, I don't want to get caught up in how we define profitability. I'm just making a general statement about internet companies in LA make money. Why is that? I don't, I don't, I, it's hard to explain. I think there's a little bit of a hustler culture here. I think people just know that they need to be profitable. Um, they don't. Is there it, not enough uh, sources of capital? Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, well, certainly there's more capital in Silicon Valley. I mean, that's, you know, that, that probably by orders of magnitude. Um, I don't know. I think people down here just like to, you know, b build pr profitable companies as opposed to uh, the Silicon Valley crowd, which they tend to focus on platforms, big hits, big ideas. That's what the venture guys are all about. But who agrees that LA companies are more profitable? Hard to tell. Who agrees that Silicon Valley companies are more profitable? Wow, okay, I guess we're more LA. Well, we are in LA. Okay, we have about 10 more minutes left and we're also gonna take Q&A, so that's 10 minutes including the five minutes of Q&A, right? So, um, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit about your, uh, your view on media, and you talked a little bit about distribution, and I believe you started demand with the idea of distribution in mind. And so, um, how would you advise a company here that's relying on these new distribution platforms, like Facebook or Twitter, as you mentioned? Um, how, would you, how would you advise them? Well, you know, it's... A when I think about the media business in general and the content business pre, I don't know, 2005 or so, I mean, you think about the distribution mechanisms, cable, radio, satellite, uh, you know, those, those are kind of two-dimensional mediums and you know uh, as, you're, as a content creator or producer how to create content to fit that distribution platform and the distribution experience the consumption experience is, is the same. You know, if I turn the channel, I know what's gonna happen. I mean, so you differentiate yourself with, con with content. Right. But on the internet, the product experience is almost as important, and some would say maybe even more important, than the actual content. And the same is true now for the mobile experience. So as a, as a media company in this era, I, you, you can't, I can't even envision thinking about a business that doesn't think about content creation and distribution at the same time and how, how it all fits together because you're shaping a new consumer experience. And you could have the absolute, this is the, this is the big mistake I think that the, the traditional media companies made is they just thought they would take their content, repurpose it for the internet, and magically they'd have an audience. Right. And they didn't understand that the websites needed to be good and they needed to be fast, and that they needed to have interactivity, and they just got there late. So now what you're seeing is a lot of companies who are creating content that are specifically designing in that product and user experience, and I think those are the companies that are gonna be successful. So when you think about content, think of distribution, but also don't diversify, don't think of multiple distribution platforms. We talked about that. Well, we, yeah, we spent a little bit of time talking about that. I mean, if you're a raw startup, You've got to do one, start doing one thing really well. If, you know, d don't be so overly ambitious that you're going to focus on three platforms at once and not have any of them work. So, yeah, you might build something for, and then you're seeing companies like Flipboard. It's a good example of a company. That, you know, they built a content experience for one device. Now they're going to have to try to think about as a business, where do they go from there? But they've had some success, obviously, getting that experience nailed. How, if you can just characterize, how has the media industry changed in the, the last five years and how will it look different in the next five? Um, I, I, I think the last 
uh, well, if I, think, if I think forward five years, I think there's a big revolution happening in video. And I think maybe the last five years were a little bit more text-centric. So the proliferation of the devices is just demanding that you have that video experience. And you have a really good live content experience, too. So we have a product that we acquired. It was the first acquisition we did called Cover It Live which is just killing it in terms of its, its breadth of distribution because it's just a very simple, easy to use pro, uh, product. And so the challenge is how do we take products like that and, and uh, extend them into a video experience? Okay, any video companies out here? Okay, there's several. We have, uh, so guys get ready for your questions. Do you wanna ask, um, and I'll open it up in a second, but um, we're, since we're here in LA, you're head of M&A, what, is it, what are some of the hot trends you're seeing in the LA area? What are some of the things that uh, you want demand to get into? Um, well, probably touching on the video experience a little bit, I, I think it, people make a lot of noise about the Facebook platform. They make a, not a, a lot of noise about Twitter. Not a lot of people talk about YouTube as a social platform. And I think that the LA community is pretty well positioned to capitalize on that, given the access to talent, given the creative forces here in LA. And if you think about those, those platforms and the birth and the emergence of new video channels that you know, may in 20 years replace Discovery Channel, okay. that's going to happen here. That's not gonna, I don't think that's going to happen in Silicon Valley. OK. Any uh, questions from the audience? Oh, we have somebody right out there. 723. Hi. Um, yeah, I had a, I had a two-part question. Um, and essentially what it is, is um, the first part is considering this kind of been a lot of talk about sort of demand and the relationship with Google and particularly with sort of, um, I guess, because with demand there is the tendency for people to perhaps search online for a particular item um, relating to say eHow and, and then obviously getting a, a, a hit on eHow. So how do you sustain um, people's sort of search behavior? And so that was one part question. And the second question is um, sort of related to um, your writers. How do you motivate your writers and content producers to produce the videos that they do on YouTube and particularly on some of your websites like eHow? Because obviously there's been some controversy around um, the, the payment mechanism and the algorithm that you do use? That was a long question. There okay. was. I'm going to try to remember each of those parts. I think the first thing is just in terms of thinking about how we build our business. I mean, what we have understood, I think, very well is how people use the internet to consume information. And the, the challenge and opportunity for us as a company is to evolve as the internet evolves across multiple platforms. So we built a lot of flexibility into the system so that we can process data signals from a lot of different sources, understand what people want to consume, and then create that content. So you know, the nature of the content will continue to change and evolve. Uh, the, uh, you know, the formats, the types of content, adding different types of photo products, you know, the, audio, the internet audience is massive. We're, we're a, a publisher that has been designed to really suit the needs of a, of a fragmented consumer. So I guess that's the, the answer to the first question. The second question, as it relates to the writers and the content creators, there's a, there, there are a number of motivating factors that drive people to create content for us. One of them is money. They get paid. You know, they, I, I think most of the people who've been in the system for a while feel like they're earning a, a, a pretty good wage for the time and effort that they put into it. Um, a lot of people want to build their resume. A lot of people want distribution. Um, you know, we've got a, a blog network that is, uh, you know, syndicated across our own network of sites, which reaches over 100 million people. So, you know, in some ways it's not unlike the Huffington Post in that, in that sense, where people are creating content for us um, that's a different style and format. And you're gonna, I think you, you know, it's a really exciting time for us as a company. I think you're gonna see a lot of really cool stuff happening in the next few weeks and months. All of those things are geared towards building that ecosystem of content creators. 
you know, we announced the partnership with Rachel Ray in the, for, for eHow Food. We have the partnership with Tyra Banks and Type F. We obviously have a partnership with Lance and, and Livestrong. So people want to be associated with those brands and they want to create content for those, for those sites. Recently, there was an article that came out that talked about how angels are sort of setting the values on companies, especially when they get into their A rounds or their B rounds, and how they're setting them too high, and how it's detrimental to the founders and also detrimental to, to the VCs. And given that there's sort of a barbell shape between angel and VC, and it's hard for startups to sort of jump that gap, do you think? Do you see sort of a uh, a bubble bursting in angel investing, and so it's going to be harder for startups to to get off the ground in next year or so? Uh, I I don't think I see a a bubble bursting for angel investing. I mean, a, and that that category of investors is so new um, that I, I, you know I. I uh, so I don't, th I don't think so. I mean, I think it'll, that it'll be a little burst, right? Like a pop, because they're only putting twenty-five thousand dollars in at a time. And well, so I mean, it just it depends. I mean, there's a you know, you, there's we're in a market now where the IPO market is opened up again. You're seeing companies get listed and get good prices and pick up some currency, and those companies are going to grow organically and they're going to grow through acquisition. And you know, part of that acquisition strategy is acquiring talent. So, you know, the angel investors may have a little bit of root, a little bit of wind at their at their back because even if they put a valuation on a, uh, you know a management team at the outset, which might seem ridiculous, you know, whatever three, four, or five million dollars for an unproven entrepreneur with an idea, um, that if that entrepreneur executes just a little bit and and gets a little bit of traction and and hires the right engineering talent, that it's not unlikely that that business could be, could be bought just for, the, just for the people. And I think you've got a window of at least a few years for that to continue to play out. We're actually going to explore that question at the uh, end of the evening with the panel, the, um, the VC panel. So do we have uh, more questions? Okay, we're gonna wrap it up with a word association game. And then we drink. Okay. You mean do shots? Yeah, we'll do shots. Right. No, okay. no question? Uh, we have a question? Uh, I'm oh, sorry. yeah, yeah, right here. Oh. I just had a real quick question, uh, Sean, on when you were starting your business, if you had to go back and start over again, what would you change? What would you do differently? Uh, God, that's a good question. You know, fortunately, we've had, um, we've had a lot of fun and we've had a lot of success that it's kind of hard to think about what I, what I might change. Um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I'd really change a whole lot. Maybe I'd, maybe I'd ask for more equity up front. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, you can always give it back later if, they, if the VCs ask for it, so. I like what you said before, that every mistake you made, it was just basically tuition. That's how you looked at it. That's right, yeah. Okay, any other questions? How, how are you, re how is Demand Media reacting to Google's attempts to change the ground rules on what people call content farms, which Demand Media is sometimes accused of being? Well, I mean, I think we've, we, we've, we've talked a lot about that publicly on earnings calls and stuff like that, and I, I, uh, I don't think I'd add anything else to that. Um, you know, we're creating content that consumers want to consume and we're doing it with innovative products, and new technology and thinking about distribution, I think, differently than any other media company. So um, we have uh, been thinking about diverse, I mean, any, any entrepreneur has to think about diversification, you know. Fortunately, it, it, it's a nice problem to have when you become so successful on one platform that you need to think about, oh shit, what happens if you know, X, Y, and Z happens? So we've been thinking about how we evolve as a business and, and um, the media business and the advertising industry online and the content business, it's so big, it's so fragmented that we just have a ton of opportunity. I think we're out of time. So um, we'll just do a wrap up quickly with this word association game. This was always fun. Okay, I'll say one word and then you give me one answer. 
Okay. Drinks. <laughs> Margaritas. <laughs> Entrepreneur. Gutsy. Venture capitalist. Rich. Media. Cool. Google. Rich. <laughs> IPO. Fun. Vader Splash. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, baby. Great.